In this chapter, let us look at some of the separating techniques for mixtures. Now we will first look at filtration. Now what is filtration used for? Now filtration is used when you want to separate insoluble solids from the quick. Now we make use of the filter funnel and filter paper in this process. The diagram shows a filtration setup whereby you have the residue that is the solid that remains on the filter paper after filtration. And you have the filtrate, which is the solution or the liquid that passes through the filter paper. Let us look at the second method, which is called the evaporation to dryness. Now, in this separating technique, we are trying to get a soluble salt from a solution. So basically, you are just heating the water to cause the water to evaporate. So you heat the solution until all the water has been boiled off. And what you have will be the solid. In this case, if you're looking at seawater, you will have salt being remained after the evaporation to dryness. So as the water in the solution is lost to the surrounding, the salt will remain as white residue that is found in the evaporating dish. Now bear in mind, not all solids can be collected using this method. Now the solids that are collected must be very, very thermally stable to heat. That means it can withstand very high heating. One example would be sodium chloride that is found in salt seawater. Okay? Now the solid that's obtained will not always be pure. So there will be some other soluble impurities that will be left behind after heating. Next, let us look at sublimation. Now the word sublimation means that it is a change in state when you are changing from a solid to a gaseous state without passing through the liquid state. Now there are two main substances that you need to remember that sublimes. The first one is ammonium chloride. So this is the chemical formula of ammonium chloride and iodine which is a purplish black solid. So both of these substances, the sublime, and this shows the setup of sublimation whereby you have got your um, substances, the mixture that has been placed in your evaporating dish and it's been covered with an inverted filter funnel. So when heat is being applied, what you notice is the substance, like example the solids like ammonium chloride was sublime and will be collected on the surface of the inverted funnel. So this method is used to separate solid solid like example sodium chloride when it is in a mixture with ammonium chloride. Both are solid and if you heat it, what will happen is ammonium chloride will subline. Um, sodium chloride will be left behind in your evaporating dish. So the ammonium chloride will be the one that will be collected at the top of the inverted funnel. Now, what is crystallization and when do we use it? Now, crystallization is used to obtain soluble solid, okay, that is from your solution, all right? Now, this solid will decompose very easily when it is being heated. So, therefore, we will not be able to collect this using the evaporation to dryness. So, the method that is used to collect soluble solid that will decompose on heating is by crystallization. So one example will be copper to sulfate or iron to chloride. Or even sugar can be collected by crystallization. Now what are the steps to crystallization? After you have dissolved the solute or the solid, you will have to go through filtration and collect the filtrate. Now heat the filtrate so that you will remove the water and what we are trying to obtain is what we call a hot and saturated solution. Let the solution cool. This is where the crystals will be formed. So once you have collected the crystals, you still need to go through filtration. Okay, filter to collect the crystals. Okay, once we have collected the crystals, you still have to wash the crystals with a very, very small amount of cold distilled water okay now the whole idea is to remove any impurities that can be still found on the crystals and finally you will dry the crystals between pieces of filter paper to get your crystals 
So there's a question. How do we test for saturation? Now what you can do is just get a glass rod deep into the solution. Now if you notice the small crystals are forming on the rod, it means that the solution is saturated. Let us look at simple distillation. Now simple distillation, again, it is a method that is used to get the solvent. So when you have a solid that is dissolved in a solvent to form your solution, okay, what we are trying to get here will be just a solvent. For example, we have got seawater which contains salt and water. So what we are getting um, out from this simple distillation will be your distilled water. So like what we have mentioned, the solid or which is the solute that dissolves in the solvent. Okay, so the solvent will go through simple distillation okay, so that we can get your water. So this shows the simple distillation setup. There are three main processes. The first process is where the water boils in the distillation flask. So when the boiling point is reached, okay, the water vapor, the vapor will uh, move up the distillation flask goes into the condenser. Now, in the condenser, this is where the water vapor condenses into the liquid and then it is being collected as the distillate in a beaker or in your conical flask. Now, there are a few main things that you need to take note. Number one, sometimes we do put in boiling chips. Okay. Now, the whole purpose of adding a boiling chips is to make sure that the smooth, the boiling is smooth. Now, next, make sure that the thermometer is placed right beside the side arm of the distillation flask because you want to measure the boiling point of the substance that has been distilled, okay, substance. And you also need to make, uh, make sure that water goes in from the end of the condenser because you want to fill up the condenser fu uh, fully before the water is being uh, moved out of the condenser. Another distillation, but this is called fractional distillation. Now, in fractional distillation, what are we trying to separate will be miscible liquid. So, in this case, we are looking at a liquid-liquid mixture. So, both are liquid and yet they are miscible. That means you can put them mixed together and it looks as though it's a single solution. It is homogeneous. Now, the first example that we make use of will be ethanol and water. So, the two miscible liquid must also have a difference in their boiling point okay so ethanol has a lower boiling point of 78 degrees celsius so therefore it will be able to be collected first and the second collection point will be at 100 degrees celsius whereby the boiling point of water is reached now the second method or the second uh, area in which fractional distillation can be used is when you want to get nitrogen and oxygen from liquefied Air. And lastly, when you want to get ethanol from the fermentation of glucose solution. This diagram shows the fractional distillation setup. So the biggest difference would be the presence of a fractionating column. Now the three processes would be more or less the same whereby you will have your mixture that has been boiled. In this case, this is a round bottom flask. Now both liquid would evaporate up at the same time. But the vapor with the higher boiling point will condense in the fractionating column. It goes back to the round bottom flask. When the boiling point of the liquid is reached, the first liquid with the lower boiling point is reached, it will be distilled over, it will condense and be collected as the distillate. So the second collection point will be when the second liquid, uh, liquid boiling point is reached, then you have to change your conical flask to collect the second liquid. Let us look at how the temperature versus time graph looks like. So the temperature will increase until the boiling point of the liquid with the lower boiling point is reached. So in this case, we are looking at ethanol, which is 78 degrees Celsius. And after all the ethanol is being distilled over, temperature will continue to increase until the next boiling point is reached. So in this case, we are looking at water, which is 100. So this is the temperature versus time graph. In another graph, this is a temperature versus volume graph. So there will be no volume collected 
until the boiling point of the first liquid is reached. So again, there will only be collection at 78 degrees Celsius. Now the temperature remains constant until the liquid with the lower boiling point is collected, is distilled over. Then the temperature will increase all the way until the second temperature, which is the boiling point of water, is reached. From the graph, you can see that there will be no volume collected. Only when the first boiling point is reached, then only there will be a collection. And then volume stays constant until the second boiling point. Okay, the boiling point of the second liquid is reached, then you will have um, distillate being collected. Now, separating funnel. What exactly is a separating funnel? So separating funnel is also used to separate liquids, liquid mixture. However, in this case, we are looking at liquids that are immiscible, which means that they are not able to dissolve into one another. For example, be oil and water. So what you see over here is a separating funnel. Now, oil is less dense, it floats on top of water. So you pour into your separating funnel. You can easily use a tap to tap off water, followed by oil. And lastly, we are going to look at paper chromatography. Now, paper chromatography is used to separate mixture into the various components and they must be able to be dissolved in the solvent. So we add a drop or a spot onto the start line. You dip into the suitable solvent, which can be water or ethanol. So as the solvent travels up, it brings along the unknown. So point to take note, the start line, it must be drawn using a pencil okay and when you are filling up the solvent make sure that the solvent level is below the start line so when do we use chromatography when you want to separate components in the mixture you want to know how many different components are there you want to identify it and of course you want to see whether if a substance is pure now this shows a chromatogram so the chromatogram is the product that you will get after the end of separation Okay, so you can see that the unknown X is made up of D. Okay, these are the two common spots. And it is also made up of A. So in this chromatography, okay, the chromatogram shows that B is a pure substance while the rest are all mixture. So why do I say that B is a pure substance? Because you notice that there is only a single spot in this chromatogram, so therefore the unknown is pure. We make use of the RF value to help us to identify a substance. Now the RF value remains the same if we are carrying it out under the same condition as in the same solvent as well as the same temperature. So even if you use a longer strip of chromatography paper, the RF value doesn't change if you are looking at the same solvent at the same temperature. Now to calculate the RF value, you will measure the distance traveled by the solvent from the start line to the solvent front and take the distance traveled by the substance from the start line to the middle so you will take 3 divided by 5 and you notice that there is no unit for RF value. Now what if when you carry out a chromatography and you realize that the chromatogram is colorless, you can't see anything. So what you have to do is you just apply a locating agent, spray the colorless substance with a locating agent and you will be able to make the substance colored. So after having said that, how do we determine if a solid or a liquid is pure? We make use of the melting point, the boiling point. What would be the effect of um, impurities on the melting point? Now, a pure substance will have a fixed and sharp melting point, whereas when you have got impurities, very often the melting point will be lowered. Like example, ice has a melting point of 0 degrees Celsius. If there's impurities found in the ice, it will lower the melting point to perhaps maybe minus 4 okay, degrees Celsius. And at the same time, the melting takes place over a range of temperature. So that means it, it's a lowered. Okay, you will start melting from minus 4 degrees Celsius and then you will start to melt all the way until minus 1 degrees Celsius. 
how about the substance given to you is a liquid. Now pure liquid, they have fixed and sharp boiling point. And when you have impurities, the boiling point will be increased. Like for example, water has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. Whereas for seawater, the boiling point can be 102 degrees Celsius. And boiling takes place over a range of temperature. So that means from 102, it starts to boil all the way to maybe 104. There's no fixed and sharp boiling point. Do also take note if the pressure surrounding the liquid is increased, the boiling point will increase.